Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming this week. This is our latest installment related to PrEP. Dr. Steckler is here to give us an update and talk about more of the concerns related to PrEP. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Joanne. Great, thank you very much. So again, today we're gonna to talk about concerns related to sexual behavior among people on PrEP and about sexually transmitted infections. As you many have you may have seen me present this slide, Truvada now represents another blue pill for sex. So we're gonna talk about three main things. One is the concerns that people have, the real concerns that we have about behavioral disinhibition or risk compensation, and then talk about where the data are for what PrEP has done to sexual behavior, and also talk a little bit about sexually transmitted infections for people who are on PrEP. So why is there concern? Where well, there's real concern that if people change their behavior and are therefore more at risk for HIV, then that could actually theoretically negate any prevention benefits of PrEP. And I'm gonna show you a slide that illustrates that in a little bit better. But also I think as important is our own morality and judgment about people who are using PrEP that in many ways, our fear is that people are going to stop using condoms. Condoms can prevent other sexually transmitted infections and abandon condoms and go wild. And I think that partially that that is, that is on us to recognize, but it's also that perception has been taken upon by many of the people who are going on PrEP and they feel like that uptake to PrEP indicates that I am a sexually promiscuous, I'll put that in quotes, person. And it's important to remember when we're talking about PrEP in the context of other sort of, sort of related interve medical interventions that birth control never led to an increase in sex. A needle exchange doesn't lead to increased drug use. And the HPV vaccine, human papillomavirus vaccine, didn't lead, hasn't shown any evidence to lead to an early sexual debut. So a lot of this is our fears at providing these to people who are at risk. So this is a complicated slide, and my goal is only to illustrate a few things for you. This is a paper looking at effectiveness and cost effectiveness of PrEP in several different scenarios related to efficacy of PrEP or adherence of PrEP and the prevalence of your population and then to get at this question of sexual risk. So these three sets of tables <coughs> are different conditions for how well PrEP works. So the top is a very low adherence, low efficacy situation. The bottom is a high efficacy situation, but what I'm gonna show you first and have you focus on first is this middle box, which is the expected adherence of 44%. As some of you may remember, this is the efficacy that was identified in the IPREX trial, the trial of about 2,500 men and transgender women who have sex with men, that that showed that Truvada as pre-exposure prophylaxis reduced the risk of HIV acquisition by 44% in the intent, modified intent to treat. So what we know from this is that adherence really varied among this group. But I want to focus on this as the middle situation. And as you go to the right, this is HIV prevalence in the population from this is point, so 5% up to 50% prevalence in your population. And then as you go down in this box, you'll see a change in sexual risk or, or more risky behavior. This is effectiveness, so measured as number needed to treat in order to prevent one HIV infection. So lower numbers, fewer people that needed to, and it's not important that you can actually read these numbers, just the, the lower numbers are the ones that are in yellow. Fewer people needed to treat in order to prevent one HIV infection. The higher numbers in pink, more people needed to treat. So effectiveness also patterning cost effectiveness. I'm not showing you cost effectiveness here. But in this situation where adherence is pretty average, 44%, that the number needed to treat and the cost effectiveness are fairly low until you get to very low prevalences. Okay? And then you get some change as there's behavioral disinhibition. But I think most of us are sort of living in this world where, if, again, if adherence is 44%, our prevalence is about 15 to 20% in men who have sex with men. Um, and so there could be a potential impact if people have more risk, if they make real big changes, really big changes. But again, I think the 44% is going backwards in time. And really where we are, let's go back sort of again as just as an illustration. In this situation, 
where adherence is fairly poor, I think they estimated a 32% reduction using PrEP, that it's really not effective at all unless you get to very high prevalence situations and no behavioral change, and that there is potential harm in prescribing PrEP in very large changes in behavioral disinhibition. But again, I show you this as illustration and not because I think this is anywhere near reality. And where I think we are in closer to reality is efficacy closer to over 90%. Because in the open label extensions that we've talked about, there have been essentially one or two cases of people who have been adherent to their medicines who have actually gotten infected. And so what's interesting to me in this situation, again, sort of the yellow and the light green really being effectiveness and cost effectiveness, that you can go down to fairly low HIV prevalences and still have it be effective. And most importantly, that behavioral disinhibition doesn't really impact it at all. So I just think that this is, again, this is modeling data. This is not real data. This is extrapolation really intended to just help you understand how these how prevalence and adherence and behavior might impact our PrEP use and our cost effectiveness. Complicated slide, I'm sorry about that. So I wanted to now take a step and say, what do we know about sexual behavior among people on PrEP? And the first slide I'm gonna show you is from the randomized clinical trial. You've seen this slide probably before. And this is data from IPREX, again, that study of men who have sex with men and transgender women, and then Partners PrEP, which was in heterosexual discordant couples in Africa. On the y-axis in IPREX is the percent of the respondents reporting unprotected receptive anal intercourse. As you know, we're transitioning to calling it condomless sex because sex on PrEP is protected, So, but this is the figure from the slide. And then in partners, it's the proportion of, of participants, the HIV negative participants in the discordant couple reporting any condomless sex. And essentially in both of these placebo-controlled trials, in both the placebo group and the active group, the number of participants reporting some measure of sexual risk goes down. Two things about this, it's not really surprising when we monitor people, when you, when you have, are observed and you have to report your behavior, that things tend to look better over time. The other thing about these randomized trials is, of course, at this period of time, people didn't know whether they were an active drug, and we didn't know whether PrEP worked. So this isn't really as informative as what we're going to find when people go, we know that PrEP works and people know that they're on an active medication. And the first thing I'm going to show you is open label extension. So people in these randomized trials that once there was knowledge of efficacy of Truvada as PrEP, they went on open label PrEP. They knew they were getting Truvada. And this is the data from partners PrEP, again, the discordant couples. This dotted line is when people started receiving open label PrEP, and there's really no difference in the amount, this is monthly frequency of condomless sex per person in the open label extension, but no change in condomless sex in sexually transmitted infections or pregnancy in this open label extension research group. So what about the real world? So in the real world, there are all sorts of other factors, and I love to show this slide of what has happened in, this is a screenshot from Grindr, which I will affectionately call a dating site. And what's happened is parallel to what happened when it became out in the community that when you were HIV positive and undetectable that your risk of transmitting was really low. And so what you can see on this insert is that PrEP is now an option on your dating sites. So PrEP is now a characteristic that people may search for. You can talk about it yourself and people may search for in terms of partners. So we're in a very changing world. The first slide I'm gonna show you is a complicated slide from the demonstra the demo project. So I'm gonna put everything in quotes today. The demo project. And this was a study led by Al Liu in based in San Francisco, but included Miami and Washington, DC. It was a CDC funded study. And on the left side, we're gonna look at sexual behavior. On the right side, you're gonna look at sexually transmitted infections. Two things to note in the sexual behavior. In these bars, is our new abbreviation is NCRAS, non-condom receptive anal sex, I think is what that stands for. And the proportion of the participants who were screened and went on PrEP in the demo project, somewhere between 60 and 70% reported that they had had condomless anal intercourse, and that is stable across the year of the study. So no increase in the number of participants reporting condomless anal sex. In the two lines, you have in this orange line here, you have receptive anal sex without a condom, 
and receptive anal sex with a condom in that dark blue line, and your axis is over here on the right side. There's a mean number of episodes in the interval. You see no increase across the study in the number of episodes, mean number of episodes that people are reporting while they are on PrEP. And in fact, there seems to be a decrease in the number of sexual episodes with a condom for whatever reason. But clearly no increase in sex without condoms in the demonstration project. But the thing that's coming out of this is there are a lot of STDs in this group. And so these lines show rectal, any rectal sexually transmitted infection, any pharyngeal sexually transmitted infection, any urethral sexually transmitted infection, gonorrhea chlamydia is really what we're talking about, and then any early syphilis. And what you can see, this is baseline. This is people not on PrEP. There is a very high proportion of these participants who are diagnosed with STDs at baseline, and it's very high throughout the entire study. And that's similar to what other people have seen. This is the first on the left is data from the Kaiser Permanente group. In their hundreds, several hundred people who are on PrEP, 50% of them had any bacterial STD during their first year of follow-up. Lots of STDs. Really important, this red line, I didn't put this red line in here, but I like this, this arrow, no HIV infections in this population. And so you think, okay, well, maybe being on PrEP is leading to increased STDs. Well, on the other hand, if you look at this population, this is a comparison from the PROUD study, which was one of the PrEP studies. This is the year prior to going on PrEP. There's a lot of STDs in this population. And so the key messages are people who are at risk for PrEP have a lot of STDs, and it's regardless of whether or not they are on PrEP or not. So I just want to bring us back to the guidelines and talk about one issue related to this and talk about STD screening in the guidelines. There are two slides related to this. One is this is the frequency of when you're supposed to do evaluations, and everything gets done at baseline, as you all know. And then HIV testing is recommended at three months, and general STD screening, including oral and rectal screening for men who have sex with men who are having receptive oral, receptive anal intercourse every six months. And the recommendation is to assess for symptoms of STDs or symptoms of acute HIV every three months, but really the recommendation is only to do testing every six months. And there were two presentations at CROI, Conference of Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, that deal with the issue of how frequently are STDs missed if we are only doing screening every six months. And what you can see on this slide, this is data from Stephanie Cohen in San Francisco, and the proportion of infections that would have been missed if we were only doing Q6 month screening. With the idea is that you would do six month screening and every three month screening for symptomatic, but you're gonna be missing the asymptomatic infections at that three month and nine month visits. And so you can see that about 30% of gonorrhea would have been missed. Again, ultimately delayed at, at, if you're doing six month screening, but there would be a period of three months where you would have had the opportunity to identify that infection and not treat it. Again, sort of 20% in syphilis, 40% in chlamydia, but 35% overall of infections. And so I take from this in a, in a population in which you have risk for STDs that we really should be doing three-month screening, and that is my practice. Again, doesn't necessarily have to be done in your doctor's offices. There are lots of other sites, at least in Seattle, and I'm sure in your locations where STD and HIV screening is available. So I don't feel like they need to come see me, but they do need to get their screens done. Finally, this is my last data slide. I think that even though we haven't necessarily seen any change in behavior or any real increases in STDs due to PrEP, there are a few things that we're gonna be watching very closely. And what I'm showing you is syphilis data from Seattle King County. This data came to me from David Katz, who's currently with the health department. And it's a complicated slide, so I'm gonna walk you through it. The first thing I want you to see is in this black line, we're gonna look at incidents among HIV positive men, men who have sex with men, incidence of syphilis in HIV negative men. So the first thing you want, you're gonna notice is the fact that the number of the incidence of syphilis in positive men is about tenfold higher than it is in HIV negative men. Locally, we pretty much have felt like syphilis has predominated in HIV positive men who have sex with men. The other thing to note is in these bars, look at just the total right now, Syphilis is going up. Syphilis is again on the rise. We've had, again, record number of syphilis cases in 2015, and 2016 looks like it's on track for that too. 
So syphilis cases going up. But the one thing I really want to point out here is this lovely pink bar. This is the, in blue, is the absolute number of cases in HIV positive men. Pink is the absolute number of cases in HIV negative men, green in non menosexual men. And hopefully you can see that this size of this bar is bigger than it's ever been. And so one thing that we may be seeing with PrEP, and this is hypothesis, is that with PrEP, that people, there's more mixing between HIV negative and HIV positive men. That's great, reducing the stigma about having sex with HIV positive men, but it may mean that we're gonna see more syphilis in HIV negative men. Again, we sort of have limited amount of data. 2014 looks a little weird compared to both 2013, 2015, but just something that we're gonna be following over the next few years. So finally, conclusions. Hopefully you believe me, There's we have a lot of concern, but no evidence of behavioral disinhibition or risk compensation associated with PrEP. PrEP is intended for people who, for whatever reason, can't, don't, won't use condoms, and PrEP reduces the risk for HIV acquisition. Frequent STD screenings are really important in this population, whether or not someone's on PrEP, and we're not necessarily seeing any increase in STDs because of it. So thank you very much, and we'll take questions.